Okay, final question. Final question. Favorite drum machine of all time? What's up, y'all? This is Guy Body Science from Drum Machine Addicts. I'm here today with the one and only Mark Bird. What's cracking? What's cracking? Man, so uh, me and Mark connected a couple months back at a recording studio in Atlanta. Um, dude had a good vibe. We just had a chance to chop it up about everything from <laughs> conspiracies to life to just everything. producer stuff. Good. And uh, I really wanted to sit and have this conversation with you because I feel like one thing uh, the producer community needs is just like mentorship. And I feel like even from like jump day one, you weren't like stingy with any secrets or anything. You were just like, yo, this is how you get your drums to smack. This is how you do X, Y, and Z. Yeah. And um, I just felt like that was dope, man. So I'll always rock with genuine spirits. Man. So, uh, likewise, likewise. Man, uh, if you want, let's uh, let's get started kind of telling the people about your journey, how you got to where you are today. Jesus Christ, it was such a, such a long, it a, started as a twinkle in my mother's nose. <laughs> um, man, my journey is very extensive. Just, um, I got into music super early my uncle was a producer so i would always be around so i would hear him when he would dj at first and it's like then he rapped and then he was like one of the first producers that like in the neighborhood that you knew like like when they crew rapped against other crews they was like the only crew to have their own beats because it wasn't many producers oh, so it's like oh everybody else rapping over instrumentals and they have their own production their own songs so around like seven, eight, like I would bug him so much. And then he asked my mom, like, yo, can I take him with me? And my mm -hmm. mom would start letting me go. So by like seven, eight, I'm in studios, like two in the morning, bored. Like, I want to go back home with my friends. It was like terrible. <laughs> so it started there, and then it just started taking a life of its own. And, you know, I got into music myself, and I started rapping. I was like, I was cool. I was was all right at rapping and then it was like making beats and producing was always a thing like so like when my uncle would bring drum machines home i would sneak in his room and learn how to work joints what's the what's the earliest one you remember him having or are they all kind of just like eh? man it was uh the first the first thing i've ever played with was a Casio SK-1. Ah, okay. That's still, like, yeah. I got to get one of those just for that purpose. Then it was, like, he had the Dr. Rhythm, and he was one of the first people I seen with an MPC, and he had an MPC-60. Oh, sad. So, yeah, I watched I watched him do the magic with that. Like, he would put the record on, and it only had, like, four or five seconds of samplings on. Hmm. So once he hit the joint, he'd just spin the record super fast to get as much as he could. And then he would chop it and slow it back down. Bro, the level of skill, just just to fan out for a second, the level of skill that takes. Because, like, yeah. these days, like, because you're on machine. Yeah. I'm on MP. And, like, all that stuff is, like, unlimited sample yeah. time now. So, yeah, and uh, that's how they had to give it up. And it's like, I think it's DJ Premier. He still uses the MPC 60 mm -hmm. because he said that small window is what makes him creative. Ah, okay. So he never that even upgraded. Sense. So... It's kind of crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Man, so, okay. So, that was your road around seven or eight. Yeah. Getting into that world, playing with drum machines, mm -hmm. being at sessions with your uncle. Yeah. When did it start to click for you that this would be a path that you at least wanted to, like, go down? A long time after that. <laughs> like, after that time, it yeah. was like, um, bless my, my mom for, I don't know, I had an advanced spirit. So it was like, I was never really doing the stuff that my friends was doing. So it was like, okay, cool, I'm in the video games. And my homies were still playing. So it's like, once they jumped to video games, I'm like, all right, now I'm about to go hoop, because play ball, you get girls. So yeah. then the homies was like, all right, we gonna hoop. When they got to hooping, I'm like, all right, I'm on the girls. When they got to the girls, I'm like, all right, I'm on the money. <laughs> and it was just like, I because I hung around my older cousins. Yeah. So I was always moving faster than I should have been moving. All right. So I, I've always loved music. I've always dabbled with it, like, seriously. And I think, like, it took, I was probably, like, 17, 18 when I figured it out, when people was like, yo, 
yo, you made that? How much would you charge me for a beat? And I was like, word? Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. So that's when like I started to see something in it. Okay. But that was like 17, 18. So it took a long process of, it was a lot of stuff that happened in between. Okay. And so, and because the audience may not know, um, originally you were in a group with your friends called Freshman. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. That's, that was, um, well, my initial introduction to producing, I was, I was just by myself and I was living in Augusta, Georgia at the time. And then after that, I linked up with an indie record label in Baltimore oh, okay. and then I moved to Baltimore. And I was like, it was like me and another guy. We were producing for like eight, nine artists by ourselves. It was just like we was on our Manny Fresh tip. And then after a while, he left. So then it's now it's just me producing for all of these artists, cranking out albums by myself, like really getting acclimated to producing. Like, okay, this is your hook. This is what you rap about. This beat is this. You do this. Okay, I'm going to go Swiss Beats it. I'm going to yell on top of you while you rap. I was doing all of that stuff like in my early 20s we're talking like 21 22 mm. i'm producing for like seven eight artists in addition to getting hired to do other stuff for other artists so i got my my feet wet into full production early yeah so then after that i moved back to chicago that was like i was like 25 okay and that's when i met the homies from the freshman and that's when we started to take everything up a notch it was like okay, this was this was cool, but how do we make like very impactful records? And that's what we started to do with each other. So I actually like my first, a bunch of my first placements, my first majors was with my bros, the freshmen. You know what I'm saying? Shout out Mac, JL, and E. So what was the uh, what's the first placement you guys got, or which one sticks out the most in your mind? Um, I, I think the one that like really was the one that we figured it out was it was a Twister record. Okay. And we actually ended up with two records on Category F5 album, and I think that's when it clicked. Like when you go into a store and you buy a CD mm -hmm. on a major artist, and you're on it. Yeah. It was like. Okay, this is real. This is like very tangible. Okay, cool. Let's keep it. Let's keep running with it. Would you say at that point? Because I know we've had conversations before about um, like the idea of like purpose and everything. Yeah. Would you say that's when that kind of clicked to you, where this could be uh, your purpose or one of your many purposes? Yeah. Okay. That's when I was like, okay, this could be something special at mm -hmm. that moment. That's when you like, oh, okay, this is this is different. Yeah. Not many people actually hit that mark, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying, of being able to produce for a major artist. Yeah. So it was it was a it was a milestone for us. And we was like, okay. Yeah, we all right, we have to keep going now. Right. Yeah. Okay. And what and now that I think about it cuz I don't think we uh, ever covered this. What were you guys producing on back then? Cuz this is like 21, 22 for you, right? Yes. No, this is a all right, the freshman days was I was like 25. Okay, gotcha. So prior to that was like when I was in Baltimore, I was um, MPC 2000 Excel, <laughs> um, Cord Triton, um, and a bunch of different racks. I had the Proteus 2500. That was crazy. I might get that. <laughs> I think I had a Roland JV 1010. That was fire. I might need to get that too. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then it was like when I got with the freshmen, they were they had an MPC, they had the Triton too. I had I had brought my MP and my Triton with me, and then they were the ones. Well, actually, my man Mac, he was the one to put everybody on software. Ah, uh, okay. Because we were still hardware. We would be the guys. We in the, we in the studio. We got a. We got an MP, we got a micro cord, we got a Triton, we got a Motif, we got a this. We in the joint jamming with like an MP and like six, seven keyboards. And we still dropping everything in the Pro Tools. So it was like, then the homie came came through and was like, yo, we got to try this reason. It's like, what is that? <laughs> I was the last one to convert. I was just yeah. like, yo, if my formula ain't broke, I ain't doing it. Right. So then when I got, uh, that was my first introduction to software was Reason. Okay. And dang, so that's, I mean, that's kind of a jump to make too, like from going hardware Where to, to Reason. Reason. Yeah. And now, like, I know cats who are on Reason, they're like, I don't need anything else. Yeah. And like, you've kind of like pivoted to Machine. Like, uh, yeah, because Machine was just like, 
I came from the drum machine school. Ah, okay, yeah. So it's just like from my very first introduction to making music was playing with drum machines and then my, watching my uncle. Then the MP was like my thing. Mm -hmm. So then it was like, Reason was great, but I'm like, I miss the pads, I miss chopping. Yeah, and yeah, then yeah. when I got the machine, I was like, oh snap, it's basically Reason and a MPC together. Yeah. I was like, oh, this is it. And I was oh, sold. I, I, I never, I haven't even, I haven't strayed since then. Okay. And so, now that I think about it, just uh, piecing together your journey from where you were at now with the uh, or where you were at with the freshman yeah what's the next jump how do you get to atlanta from there we um after the twister record we started to realize that it was no solid industry in chicago mm -hmm. i mean you know it was talent but there's no industry yeah so it was like yo we got to go where it's at so then we started venturing out like me and mac we started venturing out early so it was like i met these guys like oh five late oh five early 06 hmm. me and max started to venture out we bounced and went to cali to like the ascap expo in like 2007 and that's when we was just like oh we gotta go back we gotta like move around so ever since then it was like move and shake move and shake all right let's take this trip let's take that trip so um we heard about these beat battles at apache hmm. and uh my my partner tone used to be killing them joints and my guy used to be with tone and he was like yo you gotta come down here and battle and he's like, yo, it's this one nigga. And I'm going to shout him out because I've been hearing about this. The legend who is this guy since like 2008. Yeah. It's like, yo, it's this dude, man. He from Alabama. His name M16. You got to come battle him. It's him and another dude named Sam Adams. They killing everybody. Yeah. It's the drums, though. They drums is crazy. Yo, drums is crazy. You got to come battle. And I never did it. And then eventually, like, in our conquest to move around, we came. Hmm. And we battled at Apache, and we lost in the first round. <laughs> it was so bad. It's like, dude, we drove all the way here to lose. It's trash. Hmm. But in that, we met so many people, and we had network with so many folks. Like, even prior to that, so when we got here, we we kind of knew a couple people, and then we met this guy, and he worked for Interscope, and he asked us one question, and the question was like, so what are y'all doing in Chicago? And me, I took it figuratively and literal i'm like what exactly are we doing there and then it was like what are we doing here like why are we here there's no industry here so then it was just like yo i was like yo we should move to atlanta everybody was like all right cool yeah and we basically like bounced out went back to chicago did what we had to do and we like came back like a month later oh dope dang yeah, we wasn't playing. <laughs> we went back, we sold everything that we could sell, we kissed babies, shook hands, and bounced. See, man, that's crazy, because I feel like, uh, on one hand, I see some producers and, and artists to an extent, too, who are ready and willing to make that kind of jump. Yeah. Who, like, yo, I got to sell everything, I got to go. Even, um, I was talking to Ray one time, and he was just talking about how he had to kind of, like, build up, and he got to a point where he had to sell off his gear one time, and he was like, I'll just get it back. Like, what what gave you that kind of either solace or like that that knowing of you know what i gotta do this right now but it's gonna come back or was there ever that feeling it's like man it's there's two things it's like it's, it's god and one thing for sure i'm always better on myself mm, yeah that's just it and like i tell people all the time like one of my favorite like my favorite statements to even tell like myself even like as a father i tell yo it's it's only two forces in this world that can truly stop you and that's god and yourself yeah and it shouldn't be in either one of y'all's plans hmm. it's Damn. that simple that's a bar so it's just like all right cool i'm gonna figure it out yeah and we got here and it was it was hard and what's crazy is as tough as it got, like there were times where we had no lights, no food, no water, no gas, all at the same time though. Oh God. <laughs> now, Dang. with all that being said, there was nothing that stopped us from going home mm -hmm. and being comfortable. We could have all went home, stayed at mom's crib for like two, three weeks, found a job and got right back. But that ain't what we came here for. Yeah. We didn't come here to quit. We didn't come here to half-ass it. Y'all came to get what y'all came. We came to get, yeah. So at okay. any point, we could have went home. Mm -hmm. We chose to go through the struggle. 
Dang. Okay. Because we knew what we was doing. Like we bet on myself. Man, I'm cool with eating ramen noodles for a few for a few until you know what I'm saying, steak money come. I'm straight. Yeah. I ain't no stranger to the hustle. That's real. Dang. Okay. So now we're at Atlanta. Mm-hmm. The beat battles, Apache. Yeah. From there, uh, you end up going to um, more placements here. I'm assuming. Yeah, 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 yeah. We started. That's when we started to really like build it up. Yeah. Um, we started to like really get placements. It's like not a not like ten, twenty, thirty placements a year, but it's just like okay, here's one, but that was a good one. Oh, that's another good one. Yeah. Oh, that's a solid one. So we started to move around, mm-hmm. network, and do everything that we had to do. Yeah. So it was, it was, it was a great journey. Like me and my bros, like the journey was awesome. I can't, yeah. I never, I never say it wasn't. And eventually, I know, um, you ended up splitting off. You guys are all still friends and still talk to each other to this day. Yeah, I was just talking to them on the way here. See, that's a fan. <laughs> like yeah. we talk, like we talk almost daily mm-hmm. just we have a group chat so it's always something we either talking music we talking basketball we talking just life like we we're real friends at the end of the day like yeah to the point to where when our musical paths went in different directions we remained who we were with each other at the same yeah it never changed the the dynamic of the friendship never changed Dang, at all okay. So then, how did your journey uh, end up progressing from there after it was just you solo? Was there um, a slow point at all, or at, for me, I was always like, I, I was, I was always trying to figure it out. Mm-hmm. So it was like, I never really stopped. Like I'm, I may have stopped behind closed doors, like to to the untrained eye, but behind closed doors, I was moving. Mm-hmm. So it was like, I was, I was, I would find, I would find the dope boys that was rapping, and then I would be cool with them because you know kindred spirits and respectable spirits yeah. then they would take me to studios and i would meet other people and i would meet other people so it was always network moving shaking network moving shaking yeah and then that's how stuff started to happen for me like as a crew we met saha the prince and we started to work for him as a crew mm. but it was like certain things where it'd be moves where the crew couldn't make those moves, but I could. Yeah. So I'm going to go and represent for the crew. Okay. And then it just turned into a thing where, like, once me and the crew went our separate ways, me and Saha kept the rapport because I was always around. So then the Saha thing took off, and then, like, he was, like, my main artist for a minute that I was, like, I'm really only working with him. Mm. And then, but because of who I was with the freshmen, it was still trickle down business coming. So it was still other stuff that I was able to do. Okay. And then with other relationships that I had, people were, you know what I'm saying, able to you like get me in the spots. Okay. So, and I don't want to gloss over that too fast. Uh, you working with Sci High. So yeah. um, I know you worked with him on a No Dope on Sunday, mm-hmm. a couple other things too. Um, how did that transition happen where, um, like you guys got so close and ended up like rocking out to where you were on the album and stuff like that. Was it all just from that rapport or was it? Yeah. yeah. Um, when we initially met, it was, um, we had the same manager, Mike oh, Brinkley okay. Brinks. Shout out to Brinks. Um, he managed the freshman and he managed Saha. What was crazy is in 2011, when we like first got here, yeah. we got his email from Twitter. And we used to send them oh, beats. Dang, yeah. So we already were like talking to him. So like one day we were at the office, which also had a studio. And Brinks was like, yo, y'all might just want to wait. Saha's on the way here. So he's like, oh, okay, cool. So he walks in. Brinks goes, yo, Saha is the fresh freshman. Saha, he like, oh, snap. I got so I got crazy records of y'all beats. So we like, can we hear them? We ain't <laughs> never heard them. So he played us some stuff. And then after that, that's when we started to rock out mm-hmm. and then like i i remember we did a listening session and like when we was playing records for him he was like man i didn't know that people i didn't know it was other producers that really understood sampling in the manner that i like it to be done yeah and it was like you know probably because we're from chicago and it it's it's reminiscent of somebody that he's close to kanye so the yeah. the, the the soul the samples we back had to pay some bills for a little bit 
so yeah, picking up where we left off, um, you talked about how you were DJing for Saha, how it was just you and him, and who else on the road? It'd probably be like my my man 3D was on the road with us a lot. In the car, just riding to yeah. the next event. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we was out here acting management. Oh, like shoot. Bird, go pick up the back end. Cool, I got it. <laughs> like we was out here like that. Dang. Like it wasn't. A lot of times it would just be me and him. Like mm -hmm. our first trip, like my first show with him, it was just me and him. Yeah. It was, we flew out to Salt Lake City. But that's a real team though. Just having that close knit. Like yeah, it was. It was the team was super solid. Yeah. Yeah. Man. Okay. So, uh, transitioning from working with Sci High, I know uh, eventually. If I'm not mistaken, is Sai High the one who brings you into the Pablo sessions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, so yeah. how did that how did that all kind of come together? It's a crazy story. I don't think I could tell. That's very actual <laughs> the actual parts of it. Yeah, but um, it you know I I can tell you off camera. I'm with that. <laughs> sorry, but um, sorry, sorry, y'all. It's, it's certain things I just can't disclose. But um, yeah, it was like one night we was doing a show mm -hmm. in L.A. And we just happened to, it just happened to be Pablo time. Yeah. And it was some things that got done that night. And word got back that them things was done. And word came to the room, like whoever is in the room has to stay here. And I didn't leave for like seven days. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. I was out there with like a change of clothes. I had like two changes of clothes. Yeah. Because I was only supposed to be there for a day. Yeah. I was thugging. And if the people don't know, what uh, can you share your contributions on, like, which tracks? Um, feedback and FML have writer's credits. Don't know. Okay. Yeah. Man, so, all right, so backtracking a little bit, you go all the way from seven or eight, being with your uncle. Yeah. You know, on your first drum machines, NPCs and Casios, to boom, now you're with the freshmen. You guys move down to Atlanta doing these beat battles. Yeah. Working with Sci High, and then somehow... Manifest all that into working with Ye. Yeah. And then, boom, now now you're here. We got cool and we start talking. Like, looking back on uh, your journey thus far, what's been, like, something that you carry with you to this day that's helped you, like, keep perspective and keep it moving the right way? Oh, man, it's, it's a lot that I keep. You know what I'm saying? It's just, like, I'll say the main thing is, mm -hmm. is, and I learned this very early, it was... Man, my, my uncle, they instilled in me being great. Yeah. And that was, that was, that was it. Like, you got to be good. Like, you got to be dope. Hmm. Like, people got to talk about you when you leave. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, with that being said, nothing was ever good enough for me, hmm. even now. Like, it, it, I, I just recently started learning how to celebrate my wins. Wow. Because yeah. I would be like, Cool, what's next? Like I'm what what we doing next? Like that was my whole it's still something to prove. Every day I wake up I still got something to prove to myself. Yeah. It's like when you when you want to be the best you can be. You know what I'm saying? Like one thing I heard this once and it resonated so deeply. Greatness is not a destination, it's a direction. Hmm. You'll never be good enough. So you're going to constantly, every day you're going to get up, you're going to try to top that. So that's like one of, the, that's probably like the main thing I take from you, is I that. I feel like that's like the best perspective to have because like, I forgot who, it, again, it might have been Ray who's uh, talking about this. Ray, we're talking about Ray from Organized Noise. Yeah. Um, I think we were talking one day and he was talking about how like, he doesn't like to keep like plaques around like that. Or he was saying, you don't want to get to this point where you just, have everything around all the time to remind you because then you're not thinking of the next thing you got to do. You get so caught up in, wow, well, yeah, I, I did that. I did that. And I think, like, I think that's a dope mindset to have, all yeah. that to say, because then you're not so focused on, like, what you've done already that you forget, like, what's in the wing or yeah, you're not paying no. attention. And it's so crazy. Like, I don't, yeah, I got my one plaque hanging up, and my plaque hanging up is, it's not even for me. Yeah. The reason I hang my plaque is I have it hanging, whereas when you walk into my spot, as soon as you open the door, it's the first thing you see. Mm -hmm. So anybody that's blessed to come in there, I want you to see that and be like, yo, I'm close enough to this guy that he did it. I can do it too. That's what the whole purpose of that plaque was. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's positioned as soon as you open the door. It's right there. 
Okay. It's like, yeah, this is a real thing. It's really, it's really attainable. Yeah. And if you don't believe that you can do it, you're talking to somebody that did it. You can do it. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's what the whole plaque is. I mean, case in point, even um, even without seeing the plaque, like um, uh, telling the audience, we've we've uh, had enough conversations where I've just been able to see, like, just from your journey, just from the stories you can't tell, can't tell, or whatever. Yeah. Like, dang, you you put in the work, mm-hmm. you dedicate yourself to your craft, like it's there for the taking, mm-hmm. and that also that the journey isn't a, a one day thing, like you said. Oh no, it's whew. it's a journey. <laughs> it's, 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 it's a journey. Yeah, it's a journey. You gotta go through some stuff. That's just the bottom line of it. So with that said, uh, what are what were some of your favorite moments thus far? Like, what were some moments that you can you can sit back now and celebrate? You know, now that you're taking more time to like celebrate the wins, everything, everything, every last every last placement, every head nod, every ugly face from every like celebrity beat battle, mm-hmm. every time we even made an impact, every one of those things. Yeah. Like I I I remember it and I cherish it all. Okay. Because nobody has to like anything that you do. I can respect you and I can love you and still not like what you do. Mm-hmm. So the fact that people like it, I'm like Thank you. I'm honored. So everyone is a win. So you keep like a spirit of gratitude just throughout the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you just, certain things you just never get tired of, man. You never, you never, you never get used to. That's what I meant to say. Certain things you never get used to. Like, I'm still, I I, I have a very kid-like mentality in this music industry because I'm such a fan of this music industry, especially hip-hop for what it did to me what it did for me you feel what i'm saying hmm. so like the people that i call my peers now i i low-key be fanning out like yeah fam ray murray just called my phone dog these guys created the soundtrack to my high school career right like dog, I, I i did so much stuff listening to these records and it's like i can call these people now yeah like people would be like people would be like so what's the best thing about being in the music industry people that's not in it and i'm just like the best thing for me is being able to call the people that made my favorite records and tell them. Yeah. That is so fly. Like, you'd be like, I'd be riding a car, listening to a joint, and I'm like, I got to throw that on repeat. Y'all, got... Y'all know the person that made this. Yo, fam, what were you thinking when you did such? I'm dead serious. That is me all the time. And yeah. I do it all the time. Dang, man. So, like, <clears throat> I think, uh, diving in a little little bit more into the production side of things and um even having your favorite producers and asking how did they do x y and z what of uh what's part of your workflow that you can share you don't you know don't have to give away the sauce but i know you um you have your machine you plug up are you digging for a sample first thing or are you laying drums first thing um i was rarely one of those that did drums first that mm-hmm. used to be so weird to me really like, why, why do drums first <laughs> Yeah, because I always felt like the actual music dictates everything. Mm-hmm. So that's why, I like, normally I try to find a melody or, you know, saying a sample or whatever it is that I'm using. I try to find the musical aspect of it first mm-hmm. because that dictates what I'm gonna do. Yeah, that dictates if the snare drum needs to hit on a one and a three or the two and a four. Yeah, that dictates if the kick drum needs to or. Or, like, it dictates the swing, all of that. That's why I try to find the music first. Ah, uh, okay. I rarely ever do drums first. Interesting. Uh, oh, well, now that I think about it, that makes that makes a ton of sense. Because I've seen you chop before, and it's like, okay. Yeah. Um, so, you got your melody, you got your sample, then you do your drums. Is yeah. uh, Do you, I know you have your own pack. Is that the pack that you use with most of your, with most of your beats? Nope. No, oh, okay. Do no. you have like a faithful like two or three that you of everything maybe like mm-hmm. uh okay. Yeah, I got a I got a couple blends of like everything and th- again the reason I choose the music first, now it tells me what drums to use. Ah, <laughs> uh, dang. Okay. So now I know exact okay, this is this texture. I yeah. need this type of snare. I need this type of hi hat. Oh, this might call for a live break. This might call okay, this is the trap. Okay, this is the the hard crisp snare. Okay, this one calls for a quirky snare. The music tells you all of that. 
man, that's a that's a bit of free game for the audience too. Uh, Cause I know I'm I'm agnostic to the prostate process. Sometimes I'll do drums first, but then I'll have to strip drums off after I chop the sample because then I'm like, okay, no, this doesn't fit. It's it's doing. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. And, and then sometimes, be... like when you chop the sample and you getting ready to put the drums on it, you realize you don't need drums on it. And that's something interesting that I think you put me on a couple conversations ago. Um, can you touch on that a little bit? Like this idea of like sometimes you don't need all this. It's crowding the beat. Minimalistic. Um, I, I, I and I'll say this: there is this one record that I did called "While I Pray." couple people are sitting on it mm -hmm. there's this it's like the kick drum is just like and that's really all it is there's no other percussion is not moving but the sample is so minimum but it's doing so much it's like it's like a choir hum hmm. so when you listen to it it's actually entrancing so that being that small you like if if the beat, look at it, I'll say this. If the beat has a lot of stuff going on, yeah, and you're thinking about performing this in front of 30,000 people, everybody doesn't have the same rhythm, so everybody's not going to hear it the same. But when it's so minimal that it's not a lot going on, everybody can catch it, it's like that's when everybody is doing the same thing. Oh, snap. Damn. That's how you control crowds. Minimalism. Think oh, about man. think about think about the think about the best songs. We will rock you. That's right. all it is. All right. It, you don't have like all these crazy throws and delays and stuff going on. It's literally just simple enough to where everybody can catch the beat. That's it. Dang. Minimalism. Okay. Man, all right. That guys, that <laughs> we could go right now, honestly. Yeah. You know what I mean? Dang. Okay. So Minimalism is a lesson that you've carried for it thus far. Um, as far as samples, what genre do you like sampling the most? Any. Any? Except disco. Really? You don't, you don't rock with disco I like that? disco samples. I mean, the the drums are kind of... I don't... The synth okay. Sounds are, um, I don't like... <laughs> I don't like over, overly happy music. Ah, uh, okay. I like emotional music. Yeah. Because I like... I like to... I like to make you feel something mm -hmm. when I'm producing. Like, I want to make you feel a way before anybody even say anything on the record. Yeah. So I like emotional music. So disco is just way too happy for me. Dude, I think that that touches on another conversation we had about um, how you like to create with purpose now. Going yeah. back to, I feel like purpose is a is an overlining thing that's, like this interview. That's the thing. <laughs> yeah. So, like, w like, what do you mean when you say you like you like to have purpose when you create? Like I just don't. For one, I can't create. I don't like to create aimlessly. Mm -hmm. Like I don't want to sit down and not have nothing that I'm striving for. Yeah. And just trying to pull stuff out of the air. When I have something that I'm trying to convey, or something that an artist that I'm close to is trying to convey, and I know that they're trying to do it, that's when I perform my best, because there's purpose in it. There's a reason you want to say this. My purpose, like, we have to find a purpose in the music. Like, music was all, and as always is, the universal language, and it's it's a healing agent Yeah. at the end of the day. Like, I want to make those songs that you'll always go to that'll get you through it. You know what I'm saying? That's the purpose of it yeah. for me. Like, And that's why I like my music to be more emotional than, you know, fun. I, I love fun records, don't get me wrong, and... You know, I envy the people that can make those because I can't and I've tried. And yeah. I'm not that great at it, but I love them. But for me, like, I really I really want to make you feel something mm -hmm. when I create. So that's why it's like when I say it's purpose in the music, because I'm trying to make you feel something. I'm trying to get something through to you. Yeah. So. And on the subject of feeling, too, I think uh, we touched on a while back the use of analog gear. And I think that's something that's really coming back in music. And like, I, I'm not gonna say I wasn't a believer, cause I mean, of course I love drum machines, love you yeah. know analog gear, but like you played some beats where there there was like a Moog that was doing the bass. And I was like, oh, okay, I get it. Like mm -hmm. the texture, just the fullness of it. Cause I think the room we were in had like a sub in there too. 
And I was like, oh, okay, yeah, this doesn't sound like the 808 that I got from, from this place. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was like, oh, this, <laughs> this is the real genuine article. Yeah. So how did you get to that point where you said, you know what, let me start using analog again. And what's your favorite piece of analog gear that you have right now? Man, um, I got to that point. It was like, it, it's so many things that brought me to that point. For one, I'm, you know what I'm saying? Dr. Dre is a pinnacle for me. Mm-hmm. And they use analog, even down to the SSL board. He still runs stuff through the board. Still, wow. Yeah, he still uses the board. Cause it's nothing, Dang. it's nothing like that. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're a Jay Dilla fan, yeah, and everybody used to rave over Dilla's bass lines, bro. That was a that was a mode. He had the mini mode, or he had the Voyager. It's analog bass. That's why his bass lines did how, wobbled how they wobbled the imperfections in it. It's analog. Then you take Kanye and Mike Dean, and it's just like the stuff how Mike Dean revolutionized analog. He made it like. He brought the synthetic world of the 80s to hip hop and made it like so over the top elegant. Yeah. So it was like all of that is just like, I'm like, yo, I, I remember the moment when I really was just like, I was always a fan of it. But the moment when I was like, I, I gotta have it was on the Pablo tour. And we were in Indianapolis. It was the first show. And I remember I was the way that we were sitting. Cause we were quote unquote special guests, so like I'm literally sitting like right behind Mike Dean, hmm. so Mike is here with all of his keyboards, and we, me and Mike had, I was talking to him when he was warming up, when he was just testing stuff, and I'm just like, yo, this is nuts, right? So they're doing the extended intro to Father Stretch, so I'm like, oh, okay, this is dope, like, like this is how the show is starting. I still don't know he's floating. Nobody knows this. <laughs> Like, he didn't tell us. Yeah. So he's sitting there and chilling. And when you know, if you know Father Stretch, you know when the bass line comes in, Mike looks over and goes, watch this. Man, he started playing the bass on that mold, and it was just rumbling the entire, we're talking 30,000 people, and it was shaking the spot. I was like, I have to have it. <laughs> I have to have it. So, um... That was like when I was like, all right, let's start exploring. And then I started to get into the gear. And then there was this, there was another instance. I was watching James Blake mm-hmm. perform Retrograde. Oh, man. And um, I seen him using a Prophet. And I was like, what is that sound? I can't get that from any, like, you got to go twist them knobs to create that sound. Yeah. I need stuff that sounds like that. So that's when the that's when the hunt for gear became. Like, okay, I'm on Dude. it now. Guys, I think on that note, one more break for our sponsors. We're keeping the lights on. Stanconia, we'll be right back. What up, y'all? We had to pay some bills. We're back for the last part of the interview. Um, we left out talking about analog gear. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mark just played some stuff for me just to kind of give me a feel of like what analog could really do. And uh, from there, I think we can kind of like, you know, get to the end part of this interview. Do you have any advice for upcoming producers, upcoming artists, just something that they should keep with them going forward in 2020 and beyond? Ooh, man. Um, man, one of my one of my biggest things is, man, don't be afraid to be yourself. It's, man, an OG told me one time, man, there's a million people out in the world that want to meet you. They just don't know it yet. Just be you, man. It's a lane for everything. Like, and once you once you soak up your own lane and you just do what you do, nobody can do your stuff better than you can. Yeah. And that's that's pretty much it, man. That's the that's the greatest key to artistry ever. Like, don't try to do what other people do. Like, that's not what I do. I'm gonna do this. <laughs> like I went through that stage of like having to chase the placement, you know. As a producer, you're in this weird space of supply and demand it's like well we need these type of records it's like i'm not really that type of producer so you mimic that shit and you chase these placements mm-hmm. before you know it nothing ever lands you done lost your original juice because you've been chasing this shit so long and it's just like it ain't landing because it ain't you yeah that ain't what you do 
do your shit. Because it's people over here that want that. It's artists that need that. Just be you. Okay. So, last part of this interview, I'm just going to do some uh, quick rapid fire stuff. Like oh, that. let's go. I've been waiting to do this. Okay. Uh, NPC or Machine? Machine. Atlanta or Chicago? Chicago. Day sessions or night sessions? Day sessions. 808s or live bass? Both. Drums or no drums? Both. Okay. Uh, last, producer Pantheon. If you had to choose four or five producers to go on your Pantheon of top producers ever. Oh, oh. Um, four? I get four or five? Four or five. You can have that extra slot, that five. We'll say five. Yeah. It's going to be hard. <laughs> um... Of course, Quincy Jones is one. Dr. Dre is one. Um, let's do this because a lot of people really didn't know how great of a producer he was himself, low key. Marvin Gaye. Ah, interesting. Yeah, okay. Yeah, Marvin Gaye is there. Um, man, it's so hard because it's like after Marvin, you want to put Teddy and you want to put Teddy Riley in there. You also want to put EA in there. But then you also want to put Pharrell and Timbal in there, too. <laughs> right. It's hard. It's hard okay. to narrow it down to, like, five. I'll just say those Was six. Like I'll say those six names. Six. That's cool. Yeah. Um. Okay. Final question. Final question. Favorite drum machine of all time? Of all time? Of all time. New or old. Doesn't matter. MPC 2000 or so. I like that. I rock with that. Yeah. That was... That was the one. Whew. I don't know how my beat sounded like they sounded then. Yeah. But it was crazy. I, I, wish, I, was, I wish I was good at mixing then mm -hmm. as well as I am now. Yeah. I probably... If I was as good as... Good as... Then, like I am now mixing-wise... Yeah. I probably would never have switched. Interesting. Because okay. the production was so... What a, what is he doing? Yeah. Yeah. I probably never would have switched. Dude. All right. If you can, man, tell the people where to find you and what whatever you have on the horizon, all that. Oh, man. I'm super simple to find. You can find me Twitter, um, Instagram at I am Mark Bird. It's I A M M A R K B Y R D. Um, as far as like what I got coming up, man, I'm on NDAs. I can't talk about a lot of stuff. Um, God Level. Uh, shout out to Charity Work, who's my partner in God Level. Um, we do have our own production team as well as we have our own artist, Dante Higgins. Um, you can follow him at Dante Higgins, D A N T E H I G G I N S. And you can follow Charity at It's Charity Work, I T S C H A R I T Y Work, W O R K. Um, we are definitely dropping a lot of music with Dante and with quite a few other folks. So stay tuned, man. All right, y'all. I'm God Body Science. This is Drum Machine Addicts. We will see y'all next time. Peace. Peace.